The 80s had the general. The 90s had John Gilligan. In the noughties, it was the reign of Martin Marlowe Highland. His was a familiar path with success and power and then the recklessness. He had to go because with him, an innocent young man doing an honest day's work died. Crime World presents Caught in the Crossfire, the unsolved murders of coke kingpin Marlowe Highland and innocent Anthony Campbell. Available now on all podcast platforms. Just thanks for the coffee. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it's good they gave you a small one at long last. Yeah, it's not a product placement, by the way. We don't get... Uh, we could, we're we quite open to that. We're open to any, any sort of uh, soul selling yeah. that's available. And we have no pride whatsoever, no. but um, that's a nice size, that coffee. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. difficult to get small ones. It's it is. It is is like what you drink. <laughs> Stegging into. Yeah. Speaking just of drinking, say, just gonna say, Johnny Morrissey ain't drinking a coffee, no. is he? Um, Johnny Morrissey has got bail. In, yeah. In the in Spain, where he is facing a money laundering investigation, a huge money laundering investigation. Uh, we'll go into reasons why he got, had got the bail in a minute, but he has posted uh, a picture which I received last night. Yeah. Uh, of him with a young associate, shall we say, yeah. and he's pouring this child a glass of Nero vodka. Yeah. He's smoking a cigar. He's pretty slim down and he's wearing an Under Armour t-shirt and he has the greatest big smile across his yeah. face. Yeah. So he's back on the Costa. Back on um, the Costa. We understand he's back out and about, you know, doing what the Kinnahans do, which is telling everybody he's nobody's going to get them and he's yeah. beating the rap. It was a bit of a shock. I suppose it the the way Spanish investigations go, of course, it's just a different legal system to Ireland. You know, the way we understand it, I suppose, in Ireland is that if somebody is arrested, they then subsequently have to be charged um, or else let go without charge, effectively. In Spain, it's it's different. People are held in prison as persons of interest, really. Mm. And the charges are only laid probably the week the, the court case actually begins. So it's it's just a different system. So Johnny Morrissey has effectively been in prison since um, since he was arrested in, in September 2022 um, as a person of interest rather than somebody who's charged with a specific offence. Now, obviously, the... the it, you know, in Ireland, somebody gets arrested and you hear a file goes to the DPP and even while they're released without charge, they remain persons of interest effectively. But it's a, it just a different legal system. What so actually it, happens in it is yeah. the police investigate, and this is what happened previously yeah. in Shovel with the Kinnahans, etc. Mm. The police investigate over how many years, okay? Yeah. They collate their file. Yeah. And they then hand over their file to the magistrate. Yeah. And the magistrate then investigates the police file. Yeah, something... So th that's why it can go on so long. Depending on how big that file is, um, the magistrate will go through it. The magistrate will call people into the courtroom for questioning. Um, they nearly all get bail, actually, eventually, you know, because and it just takes so long. It can take four or five years. And yeah. I don't think there's a, probably a legal system, certainly within the European Union, that really allows people to stay that long in no. custody. No, I mean, it's exactly. I mean, that the longer you are on, on in prison on remand for a charge, the more likely you are, you are to get bail. It's just judged to be unfair. Obviously, we've seen in the North, some of the paramilitary trials of, you know, people have been you know, waiting for so, so long. So look, it was probably inevitable he was going to get bail. If you remember Oper Operation Shovel, uh, the same thing happened with the Gillens. They were in prison for a number of months, probably something approaching six months, I think. Uh, I think Christy Kinnahan Sr. was in even lo slightly longer because he had a, a more extensive criminal history. But they got out. And when they got out, um, you know, which, I, which we hear Johnny Morrissey is doing as well, it's, they like to come across as, here I am, bulletproof. They're this never, ever going to get me. And why do they do that? For the obvious reason that people, if they owe Johnny Morrissey money and there's no doubt there's going to be a, mm. a whole credit system going on around them, they're going to pay up. And also, you know, he he he's he's back in, back in business again. As I do slightly worry about the Spanish system, though, I think. I'm not 100% sure... I don't know everything about it. No. I'm not 100% sure it's fit for purpose against organised crime. Um, you know, if we look at the 
situation with the Kinahan organization, they came out yeah. that time in 2010 after the Spanish had announced they had dismantled the Irish mafia. They told everybody that they would beat the system and they did. Yeah. And that empowered them even more because anybody that thought, but well, they're not above the law, soon realized they were. Well, they, they actually they yeah. beat it because what started as an investigation into high level organized crime, into uh, money laundering, weapons trafficking, drug trafficking was slowly depleted until eventually, I think they were left with a passport a, charge, wasn't it? A, a false registration on mm. a Mercedes and a passport charge. And, yeah. you know, for Christy Kinahan, Ross Browning was left with something. Yeah. And there was a, a sort of a financial guy yeah. that was, um, I think some he sanction. had a fake reg or something yeah. on his Mercedes. So, and that happened over the years. And, and there was no real explanation as to why that happened no. from the Spanish system. And that took nearly a full decade to, to reduce it to you know, a yeah. passport charge effectively. I think it was a couple of years, maybe three or four years before they dropped the heaviest charges. Yeah. And yeah. after that, it just kept trundling along. But I do recall at that time going out, they had got bail and they had to sign on, which yeah. Johnny Morrissey will have to do as well. Surrender the passports. They weren't allowed to leave the jurisdiction. Um, and they were kind of signing on every Monday at Estepona Court. Yeah, And there was a a magistrate who was a young woman with no protection, who was the magistrate investigating at the time yeah. that the case, and they were pulling up and going in and signing, whether that was before her or just in a book. But uh, it felt like a huge load on top of what looked like a sort of a rural district court almost. Yeah. I mean, you know, here in Ireland, the judges of the Special Criminal Court are provided with protection. Their homes are secured. Yeah. They're given guard of transport and they're protected in particular when they're sitting. And I think that is probably just something that has to happen in modern society with the power of organised crime. So here is a situation that Johnny Marcy's come out and he feels confident enough to post on social media uh, with Nero Vodka, as far as I can see from the photograph, Nero yeah. Vodka is sanctioned, as is, so, as is Johnny Morrissey by the US Treasury. You know, he's never been shy on social media anyway, despite hitting his mid-60s now. Um, he's always had a love for it. I mean, and he's coming out uh, not only, you know, obviously anything that ends up in social media is eventually going to be in public. So it's a, it's a, you know, you can see in the picture, he's got a big cigar. Uh, he looks, it definitely has, Dropped a couple of stone. Many people come out of prison looking a bit better, do I they? Do, I think, you know, it wouldn't be hard, to be no. honest with you, because, you know, he was absolutely living the high life yeah. beyond belief, yeah. eating out. Yeah. You just had to throw your eye over his uh, photo parades and, um, you know, drinking and all the rest of that, no matter what. In He was in Al Horin de Torres prison, yeah. um, which is pretty rough, I think, pretty yeah. notorious prison out in the middle of nowhere. Um bar visits. I mean, look, you have money in prison in Spain in the same way as here. You can buy whatever it is that you're, you want, but he's probably been in the gym like everybody else and using his time in there as a kind of diet. Yeah, and I mean, they do have more relaxed sections as well. still for... a little bit tubs. I'm not saying it completely. <laughs> <laughs> Doing okay. <laughs> um, you always it's, say it's... you shouldn't be calling him Fat Johnny because no, of his record. No, well, I I do always think though, like a couple, of, a few years in prison and they always come out looking good, you know? Do, yeah, they, they what definitely should be doing. But I think the problem in Spain is, um, which is it, which is not really an issue here, but we have seen it in a very micro level. I mean, Spain is a very, uh, you know, there's local police and then there's national police effectively. And there have been trouble over many years in Spain uh, between those two conflicting agendas, really. And um, the local police are a lot stronger and a lot more separate. Obviously, Spain is, uh, you know, there's been a lot of regional tensions, different regions in Spain. It doesn't hold together well. You've seen that in, in Catalonia and places like that. So sometimes um, they can have two different police forces operating in the same area and the national police, um, you know, m may have a certain attitude in the local police. We always heard uh, in relation to the Kinnins, that it was the local police that they had effectively corrupted. Um, that Only is, two members. Yeah. And, but, you know. Don't need many. No. I think in general, you know, taking a, a, an overview of the Costa del Crime, 
why are there so many criminals mm-hmm. there? Because it works for them. And, you know, we can harp back to, you know, the Brits going out when yeah. the extradition laws broke down. Uh, they actually had an extradition treaty. I was telling you this reason yeah. you heard it. And the, it was trouble with Gibraltar and yeah. their, their arguments over Gibraltar that, that broke that down sometime in the late 70s, I think, or early 80s. And that's when they all started, the ones on the run started heading out there. They created their own little community out there, which grew and grew. And of course, you have every nationality, you have mafias from all over the world based there. Um, there's a reason why they stay. They haven't been run out of it. No. I think they're part of the economy. Yeah. And I do think that, you know, I think that they have corrupted every part of yeah. Spanish society in the same way they have in other countries where they're they're there on mass. And I mean you I'm had not to, saying Johnny Morrissey has, by the way, no. corrupted anyone to get his bail. But that confidence comes from that true belief that they can beat the system. Yeah. You speak to criminals and they will always tell you that you can pay your way out of any situation in Spain. Yeah. Do you believe criminals? Well, I mean, we do know that one of the most wanted men in the world, a Morocco, M- Morocco mafia guy, um, recently was let out by accident uh, mm. and escaped to Morocco from from a Spanish prison. Um, so there are these unusual things continuing to happen in these investigations. It'd be hard to believe, though, that there was anything sinister to this, given you know, the Spanish have very much been working hand in glove with Europol. I mean, it is a Europol overarching investigation into the Kinahan organization. Yeah. It's their second one. Europol do not want to fail again. Um, 2010 was probably the first proper uh, investigation into one of these mafias that involved a number of different territories because, of course, Europol was new enough when the everyone started really bedding down onto the Costa, everyone we're talking about now, I mean, in around the 2000s. But there was a lot of mistrust still in 2010 between the various nations. And a lot of people criticised the fact that too many um, police officers from too many different jurisdictions were aware of what was going to happen against the Kinahans, as opposed to usually if there is a, you know, a big uh, a bust on, on some sort of an organisation those doing it don't usually know until they've kicked in the door and sometimes they recognise where they are. Yeah. Like nobody is told. But in this case, there was hundreds of officers across a number of different countries that were aware of what was coming. You'd like to think they've learned from their mistakes. The Spanish are very much um, embedded in Europol and they're very much working with, we have seen our Irish Gardaí out there, you know, working with them on the ground in Spain, posing directly with their, in the Garda uniforms, with the Garda emblems, with the the Guarda Seville. Obviously, there was the arrest of James Quinn. And again, that was a joint Garda Chicona and uh, Guarda Seville operation. Um, There is a tendency, though, when you see the likes of this, when you see somebody as significant as Johnny Morrissey getting bail and feeling confident enough to take out his sanctioned vodka, which he was using to launder a phenomenal amount of Kinahan cartel money, um, you know, a product which is essentially, it's not banned, but nobody's going to do business no, with it no. because of, of the, those sanctions. And that he feels confident enough to take that out and pose for that photograph is, it must irk a lot of people working in law enforcement and, and working hard on this dismantling of the Kinahan organisation. Yeah, and look, these investigations are hugely complex when you have uh, money, a lot of it. Obviously with Johnny Morrissey, the, the, the allegation is he used this, this system called Hawala, where, you know, um, it's an ancient Middle Eastern mo- uh, money lending system where there will, by its nature, there won't be a huge amount of paperwork of of a type. So these investigations are are very, very complicated. But there's no doubt that um that the, the part of the Costa del Sol that, that Johnny Morrissey is in, it certainly has been 
uh, infected with gangland criminals and remain so to this day, despite the fact that some of the, the major figures like the Ghanaians, but others as well, have departed to Dubai. There certainly has been a lot of disquiet in recent, oh, oh, even over the last year, around Porta Benus from local politicians saying that things are getting out of control and um, that the, the level of gun crime, while the level of murders I don't think has increased massively, there's been a steady flow of shootings in bars, outside bars. A lot of um, there's been a lot of cases of people being tortured, and this is all going on in the middle of Port of Benus, and it's nearly all connected with um, expat gangsters, really from from mostly from uh, the UK, Ireland, Holland, Belgium, you know, and then Eastern Europe as well. So. Um, so they were certainly not going to get sponsorship from the Spanish tourism. <laughs> no, 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 away. no. But I mean, Our it is it is the news business association. But it is something that that's mm. recognised by by them themselves mm. that 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 there is a an, a feeling of lawlessness in the area. Now, alongside that, there's also huge wealth, huge investment. You know, it's a beautiful place, and and all of that. You're you're correct, but it just because sort of the very top level of the of of gangland criminals have gone to Dubai. The problems remain in, in Port of Benus and it's certainly, as you've seen even from the Maros O'Shea Salazar and, and investigations and all of that, even if those guys aren't based there, a lot of the, the importations come come true there nonetheless still at this point. So I think we should go into a little bit of background about Johnny Cash Morrissey. Yeah. Um, for those who don't recall, we will just go through that and maybe that will bring us to a different understanding as to why he would p pose for a photograph such yeah. as that, because it's certainly uh, this bolshiness has existed throughout his career. I have serious questions as to why Johnny Morrissey is the age he is, still free, still as wealthy as he is with all that sort of has gone on in his background. I was only had a phone call this morning from somebody who's doing a, a separate project about him. And I he asked me directly, you know, the big question would, is always when you have these guys, is he touting or is he an informant? Yeah. We never can find that out. We no. can never, ever, maybe if they're dead and gone and papers are released in, in decades to come, and we certainly won't be sitting here podcasting, yeah. um, maybe it, it might emerge. But he is one of those people that there's questions about him and how he's got away with things for so long. So Morrissey's background is he's from the Rochdale area of Manchester. Manchester, yeah, just outside Manchester. And he was sort of worked as a heavy for gangs there for years. Um, it was said in this country here by Felix McKenna, the former head of the Criminal Assets Bureau, that he was suspected of being... Uh, suspected of having involvement in up to 30 gangland murders. He was working definitely as a heavy... Um, in that region for various gangs. And uh, he would have been certainly uh, within the mix, a person of interest in, in quite a lot of murders relating to, you know, feuds over money, over um, people <coughs> getting involved with, with criminality. In, yeah, in I think I think a lot of what happened in, in, in England in the 80s, there was a big money to be made um, as in, in the doorman, as being doormen in clubs mm. and Johnny Morrissey was associated with that. So you had a you had a various, you know, major criminals in, in places like Newcastle, a lot in the north of England, Newcastle, Manchester, Liverpool. They had the Noonan family and um, you know, uh, you know, other people that they they made money not just doing the doors, but it was kind of a, a protection racket thing. So they were getting pay protection payments, even if they weren't doing a lot of work. And they were also then a, uh, sort of okaying drug dealers in to sell drugs really and they powerful were getting a position. cut. A very powerful position. Um, the, as the rave scene emerged, there was huge amounts of money to be made because the doorman would uh, effectively allow one or two drug dealers to go in. They get a huge cut, cut of the profits. They'd also demand protection money from other clubs. Um, they might stick somebody on the door, but if people didn't pay. So Johnny Morrissey was associated with that. And as you said, he was regarded as a, a, a sort of an enforcer, as initially as a, a gun for hire as well. Um, the only, the presumption is that in some way he came into a lot of money and that presumably the the 
ended up in Ireland then. Um, by the time he got to Ireland in the early 90s, he was already a wealthy man. So that's, you know, over 30 years ago. So he would have been in his early 30s at that stage. And just to say, like, you know, he wasn't just a doorman. He was associating with people and working for people at the very top end of organised crime in the UK, yeah. names that maybe wouldn't be as familiar to us. By the time he comes to Ireland, he's very much associated with George the Penguin Mitchell. Yeah. And, you know, he, he heads for Cork, which was the centre of Mitchell's sort of Cork mafia operation. Yeah, the, the monster mafia, as we call it. So, like, George Mitchell obviously certainly uh, made money in Dublin and had his associates there. But he also had a kind of, I suppose, almost there was a, a touch of the gentleman dealers, wasn't there, down in, in in Munster, where he had a couple of guys of sort of middle class backgrounds. Um, they were certainly importing drugs into there. Um, George Mitchell as well had and probably still does uh, heavy supply routes into into Liverpool and Manchester. Like that's that was a real source of 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 power for him. Johnny Marcy ended up in in West Cork, um, where there was a number of expat drug dealers. Really, wasn't there? And there was Dutch guys. It was a funny melting pot of criminality. Um, it was explained to me before. It was just in the run up to the Criminal Assets Bureau before it had set up that they wanted to be sort of on the run or away. Um, Ireland was only a short trip from the UK so or from the Netherlands or wherever, you know, a short flight. They felt they could live a really nice lifestyle um, and be untouched, hide out, spend their money um, and yet not be, I suppose... No, they weren't. There wasn't a sophisticated... Across the Atlantic or anything like that. They felt that they were nearby. Ireland suited them. Yeah, and also the the, the policing systems weren't there. The language there. even from a from a simple point of view. Exactly. You know. So John Johnny Morrissey was one of these guys who invested and the nickname Johnny Cash comes from his time in Cork where he owned legitimate businesses in the hospitality area and he was became known as Johnny Cash uh, just basically for having big bundles of notes that he liked to splash and share around. In West Cork, um, he is, was and remains a larger than life character. Uh, people who have met him says would describe him and he kind of looks it uh, as a sort of has a jovial, personable side, uh, very extroverted and all of that. Um, he's like something out of a Guy Ritchie movie. He's like something out of he a really Guy Ritchie is. movie. He really is. I mean, he's that's what the sort of, I suppose, the characters yeah. are actually based on the likes of Johnny Morrissey, the confidence, the absolute air of, you know, that he exudes this sort of power, this money. Yeah. Um, he treats his friends. He spends and splashes money like very few others. And of course, that's what he did down in Cork. He used to bring in builders and uh, et cetera and workmen from the UK. He had a, a restaurant actually down there that yeah. he sort of refurbished over a long period of time. And he'd sometimes be the maitre d' inviting people yep. in and sitting with them uh, for drinks. If he went into the pub, everybody bought, was bought a drink. He was just one of those really flash. Yeah, like a good fella, really. Yeah. Like as, as they're described in that film, you know, that everybody knew him and he knew everybody yeah. and everybody wanted to be around them and they were the life and soul of the party. And just like the good fellas in the film, Morrissey had a, a very, very sinister side. What he was doing in Cork, you know, he was obviously had a legitimate income there, but there is always the suspicion that, you know, just like we've seen in recent times, that that part of West Cork has also been a, a, a become famous as a as a drop off point for cocaine shipments across the Atlantic, and that is a belief that Johnny Morrissey was playing a role in that. Well, when the cab was eventually set up and they did target him, they did discover that he had. Um, boats mm. and that he had deep sea diving equipment, which he was claiming was because he was interested in fishing. Yeah. And he would often take off at night yeah, on yeah, these fishing yeah. expeditions. And there was an investigation into that. They found, I suppose, what looked like um, he had the equipment to do that, but they just could not yeah. get the evidence. And there's no it. doubt there was the, the, like, you know, at that point, the, the the sophistication of the the guard the intelligence into the cocaine trade just wasn't to com be comparable to what it is now. I mean, as we talked about Johnny Morrissey's, you know, hail hail all fellows 
mm. attitude. You saw another side of it as the cab investigation went on because that kind of, uh, you know, friendly to everybody, good good time, gangster, wide boy attitude. You saw the other side to that because unlike uh, most people who who became a target for the Criminal Assets Bureau, Johnny Morrissey attempted to hit back and was certainly... Um, there was a very serious investigation that he was uh, going to attempt to murder some of the officers investigating him, including uh, the state solicitor at the time. So, Barry Galvin, who was yeah. the first civilian, I think, to be issued with his own firearm for his own protection. That was the seriousness of the, the plot to kill him. And, you know, what was uncovered was that the gun that he was going to use was going to be supplied by the Penguins mob. Yeah. Um, so... You know, you can see that connection was really, really strong there with with George Mitchell, who was at that point. I mean, Mitchell is undoubtedly, I think, in my mind, almost as big as Christy Kinahan. Yeah. Um, and he's certainly probably a little bit cleverer because he has managed to remain in Europe. Um, but he was running for decades, uh, you know, those warrants that were applied for to bug his phones during the German investigation into the cyber bunker. The the Germans are very, very reluctant to give anybody a, a, an ability to, to yeah. bug your phone. They like their privacy. So the police in Germany through Europol had to provide really quite intricate information to the courts as to yeah. why they wanted to bug Get his Get that phones. warrant or whatever, yeah. And I mean... They gave information about shipments, I mean, multi-million, hundred million euro shipments from cocaine of cocaine that were believed to have been his. Some of them seized his connections deep into the Colombian cartels. And then a fascinating connections with biker gangs. Biker gangs, yeah. yeah. I mean, just incredible. You see, biker gangs, we don't, we, we, we think they're a thing of the movies yeah, because yeah. we don't have them here. No. But the likes of Germany, which is a huge population, a huge drug market yeah. as well, obviously, I mean, they are massive there and they're the controlling influence over the drug industry. Yeah. So he is so far gone from these shores, yeah. Mitchell, that he has made all those connections. But those uh, applications for those warrants clearly showed how big he is. Yeah. Um, so that was the, the, the supply route for Morrissey yeah. to carry out this. Yeah, and threat. I mean... Uh, and it, it, it was an anger thing. It was a kickback. How was, dare you attempt yeah. to come for me? Um, now, it sort of went out in a puff of smoke because he left these shores, headed for Spain, and the cab mopped up about €600,000 of assets and, and cash yeah. that he sort of left behind. That was in around, what, 2000, early Something 2000. Something like that. So he, like, he kind of followed the same route that a lot of them took, which was, you know, to, to end up in the Costa del Sol in the 2000s. Um, they seemed to have had a, a boom time there. Probably the, the the cocaine trade at that point had become such a big feature in the European uh, underworld. Um, Johnny Morrissey probably stayed out of the papers, I think, at that point, did he? Well, I just don't know whether anybody yeah. was keeping an eye yeah. on him. Like, yeah. I mean, it's sort of difficult when you look at Spain and some, I mean, Irish media are very into crime, yeah. identifying individuals it is. and following yeah. their movement and, and, and sort of intricately examining what and, they're and doing. And our, the Dutch media, actually, which is yeah. interesting. And the what, Germans. And the Germans, right? But in the, the, the UK media absolutely did it through the, the craze That's and right. through the 80s. Yeah. And then in the 90s, it dropped off. For celebrity. For celebrity. So they, the, you know, the, the papers like the News of the World... The following Katie Price. Yeah, but they made... Not, yeah, it was sort of, it was, yeah, that's a kind of a cultural thing I think yeah. that happened there and there was, uh, whether it was the media lack of interest or the public lack of interest. Either way, yeah. But um, yeah, so individuals like Johnny Morrissey were able to base themselves in Spain and go under the radar. We don't really know what he was at or who he was connected with in the early 2000s, but we do know that about the mid 2010s, he was deeply embedded with the Kinnahans. Yes, and it was, he was and showing up at the gym yeah. in, in Marbella, and he was posting photographs of himself with key figures in the inner circle in the Kinnahans. Yes. That's when he kind of comes back on our radar anyway. Yeah, we realise this is the same Johnny Morrissey from Kinsale. Yeah, yeah I mean, amazing because uh, I remember it and you could see like you didn't have to be high powered investigator. You just go and look at Johnny Morrissey's Facebook. friend list on Facebook. Yeah. Simple as that. And you had quotes, you know, people leaving comments, figures in the underworld, 
friends of people in the underworld, you know, really weird connections from Irish people saying, and of course, Johnny Morrissey at that point was living in in this kind of mansion. He was building this mansion at, at some point. At some point in the mid 2010s, he marries Nicola Morrissey is all I know her as. Yeah. She's Scottish, um, younger woman, very glamorous woman. And yeah. they go back to uh, Edinburgh, I think it was, to this castle to get married and all their friends. Yeah. And, you know. And his first family are there as well. His first family are there. It is yeah. an absolutely bling affair beyond yeah. belief, right? Yeah. So they marry there and then they're they're back out in Spain. He's fraternising, certainly connected with the Kinnahans and they're building this enormous big mansion in outside Marbella somewhere, which is like all themed on Nero. Yeah. Is a... Uh, the Emperor Nero, who he is seems obsessed with. And there's swimming pools, various different stairwells. This yeah. thing is massive. And the building work is being conducted on Facebook. Yeah. And it was an interesting thing. So after the the no, sorry, before the Regency happened, there was a yeah. guy called David Dahi Douglas. Yeah. Who would later be murdered. In fact, Freddie Thompson is serving a life sentence, a life sentence for his murder. But in the run up to the Regency around 2015, two things happened. A guy called Darren Kearns was shot dead outside a, a Chinese takeaway and in Dublin. And Darren Kearns' associate, David Dahi Douglas, was shot dead months later while he was walking yeah. his dogs. Douglas had a bit of a background as a, a sort of, he was certainly I mean, he'd served around him. the provost, but not, yeah. I don't think, no, a he, member. No, well, he had, he'd served sentences. For cocaine trafficking. Yeah, but he had previously definitely been, uh, you know, linked to, to paramilitary activity for the IRA. You know? I think he was certainly taken under their wing in the prison system when he was serving time for yeah. cocaine, which was a bit strange. And then maybe they fell out. But anyway, yeah. so he had, a, he had a background, but he's shot and he survives it. And mm -hmm. he, for some reason, posts pictures from his hospital bed to show that, you know, he's doing OK. Yeah. It turns out, of course, that he was shot under the orders of the Kinahan um, organisation that they believed that both him and his former associate Darren Kearns had been responsible for an attempt, a shooting attempt or what was perceived as a shooting attempt on um well, it was members at the Red Cow. Red Cow roundabout, yeah, exactly. Okay. So they were they were rumored, which we, which we don't think is true now, to have driven up a car and this and was shot around November twenty fifteen. Yeah, it was sort of it was one of the key moments of the feud, but it was you know kind of went under the radar. I mean, they were identified certainly by the Kinahan yeah. mob as the two who had done yeah. this. Um, after his recovery from that shooting, Dahi Douglas believed certainly that he had managed to convince the Kinahan organisation that he had nothing to do with that he had an alibi and he sort of walked around as a free man again until he was shot dead by by uh, a Thompson uh, kill team. Yeah. But Dahi Douglas from his hospital bed is, because I was watching all this on yeah. Facebook at the time, wherever it was, he's messaging Johnny Morrissey yeah. to say to him, fabulous house, you know, yeah. Nick and arse with him a little bit, to be honest with you. God, you're amazing. Your yeah. wife, Nicola, has such amazing yeah. taste, all this sort of stuff. And Morrissey's actually replying to him. Yeah. And he's like, how are you doing? Hope you're well, buddy, yeah. sort of thing. And he says to him, uh, you know, when you're out here, you're co you're going to come and stay. Yeah. Come and stay in this house. And he's like, which room will I get? Or you'll get yeah. the best room and all this. So he was somebody that they obviously were. Now, this was all a bit public, sort of, you know. Yeah. Of course, Dahi Douglas was, his original conviction for cocaine was linked to the George Mitchell at the time. Well, there you go. I mean, that that's yeah. what was said. And when he was first shot, it was a bit of a mystery of why he was shot. Mm -hmm. And people were saying, oh, he's a known associate of, of George Mitchell. And maybe it's something to do with that, which it didn't turn out to be. But Johnny Morrissey, you know, this Dahi Douglas is kind of a, I suppose, a bit of a washed up sort of, criminal in, in Dublin. So, you know, it's amazing that these connections were that strong. I yeah, they, exactly that they were that strong. And then you could also see him, um, as I said, he was bringing sort of younger associates to the gym. Yeah. He was obviously being given VIP treatment yeah. at the, uh, the then the Macklin run gym in Porta Benus. Um, he was being photographed with Kevin Lynch and others from the yeah. inner circle of the Kinahan organisation. And um, then we move on to the aftermath of the Regency, the Kinahan brothers leave mm. Spain. Um, <clears throat> you can see that 
Morrissey is still very much connected with the the Kinahan sort of stronghold that remains in Spain. Um, and then 2020, the yeah. US Treasury sanctions. Well, before that. Yeah. So. What am I missing there now? Well, it's just an interesting bit. So the feud kicks off and, mm. you know, there's a huge burst then of social media activity oh, yes. from both sides. So, um, Could I forget? So initially, I mean... It, you get confused at this, but yeah. so the first thing was there was sort of a kind of sort of quite professional outfit putting out stuff about about um, you know Jonathan Dowdle and stuff like that. A, a social media campaign, yes. And then it followed up by a less sophisticated one from the Hutch side, which yeah. was calling all sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> it was less, uh, you know, yeah, less sophisticated to say. But then, amazingly, like, and I still remember it, like somebody wrote a book. Now, it's not amazing somebody write a book. Yeah. Any old, there's pl- plenty of old chances I've written a book, some might say. But it was amazing. Like somebody had sat down and written a book called Blood Feud. Blood Feud, and it was available free online, only published online. With no, with no author, which yeah. really doesn't sound like a, a typical book, yeah. considering the fir- that's the first thing most authors do is make sure that the name is there. So, I mean, how long is it? Is it a couple of hundred pages? It was ever, obviously, well, it's, actually... it's a good size. Like it might have been 60,000 words yeah. as opposed to 80,000, yeah. which is a regular book. But, you know, 60,000 ain't bad. So it's it's the feud as told from the Kinahan perspective yeah. with a dash of the, the conspiracies about the role of the state. I mean, you know, you could argue with absolutely with, with some of the things that are said. You couldn't argue that there was, you know, some really in-depth insider knowledge in the book. Like it was, yeah. it was obviously, uh, you know, somebody had paid somebody from the, the top level of the Canadian cartel had paid somebody to sit down and write a full book anonymously. A writer. A I writer. Mean, it was written by a writer. It was written by a writer. You, again, you could argue it's, they may not ever have won a Pulitzer, but it was a properly written yeah, book. Yeah, and like. it's like, to, to, you know, because that is a skill yeah. to, to put together a yeah. narrative and to put it together over a course of chapters. Exactly. And bring, a, you know, your strings through it. And to start and end each chapter, I suppose, yeah. the dramatic opening and a cliffhanger Yeah, ending. exactly. So it's a professional writer, like, you know. Sure. Um, and what we remember, like, so it's amazing, really, when you think of it, uh, the, the level, the depths that had gone to. It but, went in, of course, to the story of that whole background story of the the shooting of Jamie Moore at Daniel Kinahan's yes. property about the fallout with Gary A lot of Hutch. it was a justification for why Gary Hutch had to be shot or was Exactly. Shot. And, and about his shooting and then onwards to the Regency Hotel. And, and that, what was very clear that it was coming essentially from Daniel Kinahan yeah. was that narrative that bizarre narrative that he was affixed to, whether it was for his uh, his new sort of circle yeah. out in Dubai of, of international. It certainly was strange when you're from this country to think that it was his belief that um, he was targeted at the Regency Hotel in a conspiracy, a joint conspiracy between the Hutch organisation, the government, I think Enda Kenny in particular, the former Taoiseach, mm. the media um, and it was all before the general election. In well, order it was to do with... It, it, in to order, damage Sinn Féin or something. Yeah, to, to, to sort of damage Sinn Féin for Sinn Féin will be linked to this shooting. They would yes. be damaged and Fianna Gael as a result would be the Law and Order Party who exactly. would do well. So that was the belief. I mean, it didn't... If that was the conspiracy, it didn't work if I remember the general election. But, you know, the first person, was he the first person? I think he was the first person anyway we saw to share this book online. He he tweeted it or he ser- sh- yeah. shared it, whatever social yeah. media he's, he's using because he uses all of them now. Yeah. But then it was definitely, and he was the first person. Johnny He Morrissey. was actually the yeah. one, yeah. Johnny Morrissey, yeah. that drew me to it. Yeah. He was the reason I found it, yeah. that book at the time. Probably yourself as well. Yeah. And then, of course, it started getting shared by some of the boxers and all the rest yeah. of it. And that network came into play with it. But yeah, he did. And was he then their their press relations officer? Well, it was, yeah, because de facto? At, at this point, he was a public facing front for those people. Um, he had obviously not been in any particular trouble for a long time. He'd been in the papers and I think he if he certainly put himself maybe across as a former criminal who was 20 years out of it or whatever, something along those lines. And he was willing to be a bit public facing. Um, so he, he that, that happened then. 
the Kinnahans left, but Johnny Morrissey stayed and the COVID came for everybody, no matter where you were. Um, but John, Before you get to that, yeah. did he set up a website for Find the but Rats he did, or he did. Um, th- and that was, I think, even previous. So he, what, that, that eventually came in one of these leaks, um, these international consortium of journalism leaks that Johnny Morrissey had set up a, a website and he'd attempted to register it. I think it was in the Bahamas at yeah. the time. And it was a, a way to find a rat, basically, where you could sort of input information anonymously about informers within the criminal underworld. And he'd gone out to register it and, and set it up. And he'd eventually decided against it because it was too expensive. So that all came, I think the leak was actually part of the Panama Papers, or yeah. one of those major leaks. Mm-hmm. Um, so Johnny Morrissey, yeah, he was he was a kind of a public-facing guy at that stage. He was certainly nailing his colours to the Kinnahans uh, yeah. as regards on any, if anyone had sides. Yeah. Um, he was you know, out there. Yeah. And there was a load of other guys out there that'll still never be known that you could see were interacting with him. Older sort of British criminals yeah. as well. Um, and, you know, in it, through all of this, Johnny Morrissey was setting up this Nero Vodka company. Um, I don't know, it was launched, was it 2020, was it? I know certainly that they were talking about it coming. Yeah. They were working in the background on it and they had this big exciting news and they had this new vodka. Yeah. Himself and his wife, Nicola Morrissey, were pushing it. It was going to be a potato va- based vodka yeah. as far as I can recall. It is, yeah. It was being called Nero. Yeah. And there was a lot of um, social media about the designers in the background that were creating the bottle that were designing the label, yeah. all this sort of stuff. And, you know, what, wait for our big launch and all the rest of it. And the big launch happened smack bang in the middle, certainly of our first lockdown, I think, because they, a lot of people in, I think Spain, especially the Costa, continued to operate a little bit more. I think they still had outdoor dining and the bars were kind of open for outdoor and this sort of thing. And uh, yeah, they had a big, huge launch party in the Mm. middle of that. And you could see that... um, like everywhere was suffering from a business point of view, but that the, you know, I'm sure the venues were delighted with the business at that stage. Yeah. I mean, there was fire eaters, there was sort of z celebrities uh, on the cost of yeah. which turned out as guests, you know, celebrity guests. There was attendance there by a a journalist called Michelle Usden, who ran a magazine down on the Costa and who had done a profile of Nicola Morrissey yeah. as the CEO of this company, Nero. And she hailed her as someone that women should admire and look up yeah. to. She was sort of juggling motherhood, glamour and, yeah. uh, you know... A, a, Inter- this international vodka brand, which is unusual, of course, because I'm not, mean, not that the women, but, you know, like if you look at it like, you know, if you're going to, like launching a, a drinks brand, like it really is a crowded marketplace, isn't it? Like yeah. it's not, it's not something that you can do uh, sort of as, I mean, I'm sure you can brew your own wine as a hobby, but the, the way that they went straight in oh, yeah. and launched this international brand, I mean, was stunning. I mean, you're stunning. talking about stunning levels of yeah. investment in order Absolutely. to make any sort of yeah. present, you yeah. know, penetration into the market. And they did really boom quickly and as you said it wasn't just a launch over the next few months they certainly told us they were booming yeah well you know i mean, I mean? They, it was they, all coming from nero well, the brand itself that they were booming now it definitely was available because i did see it a few yeah. times on my travels i saw it and i know somebody phoned me one day to say it was for sale in the court and glaze which is this very sort of snazzy um shop down around Port Benoist. Yeah. I think there's a few of them all over. They're they're kind of like a, a chain and they have this quite, you know, high end food and drink store within this department store. And it was certainly for sale there. So they had got it, they pushed it out across businesses in Spain, probably others in Europe. And of course, they were pushing into Scotland and the UK with yeah, it. Because and they were sponsoring, uh, they were doing charity things and sponsoring rugby clubs, wasn't it? They and, were. And we have, there was an interview, of course, with Nicola Morrissey saying how she wanted to give something back to the 
children of alcohol. Alcoholics, <laughs> it was just yeah. Or really. By sponsorship of a sports club in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. Scotland. I mean, and um, yeah, and I mean, it seemed to go, they were they announcing on their, their websites and again, their social media that it was Next Stop America, that this yeah. was really going to be, this was a huge, big um you know, uh, you know that the, their their investment was paying off. Yeah. Of course, there was this extraordinary interview they did at home with, um, yeah, that Nicola Morrissey and Johnny Morrissey posed for photographs of, and it was in the Marbella's exclusive Life magazine, which again I believe is uh, Michelle Euston was uh, part of. It's so like and Hello they, magazine. It's now, like Robert. a kind of yeah, a local yeah. Hello magazine down around Marbella, and they co- posed for photographs in their home um, with Rolls, a Rolls Royce car in the background at one stage. Um, the two of them, it was really like an at home with yeah, yeah. You know, Michelle, or sorry, uh, Nicola and Johnny Morrissey. And it was, you know, she, Nicola was describing how this vodka had been awarded eight gold industry gongs since it was yeah. launched. Um, and here's the date it was actually launched. So it wasn't 2022. It was launched in the exclusive hotel Puinto Romano in December 2021. Right. Um, and she told the magazine at that stage, Nero Drinks Company will continue to support and work with local venues, adding more to our client list as well as launching in Mallorca, Tenerife, the UK, and we are finalising plans to launch in America. Yeah. We're also opening an exclusive five-star wellness retreat overlooking the sea in La Cala. We've been busy overseeing the luxury building project, gathering an expert team to deliver the latest therapies and treatments. We have a full time nutritionist, in-house yoga and meditation specialist, colonic hydrotherapy, right. cryptotherapy, whatever that is, and lots more. Yeah. So that's where they were at at that point. And they couldn't have been more public about their success no. and their businesses. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, literally posing at home for pictures. So then obviously in April 2022, you have that famous day when the Kinnahans are sanctioned Um so you have Christy Senior, Christy Junior, and Daniel are sanctioned, but along with them, there's there's four other people that are named, and one of those four is Johnny Morrissey, and he is publicly sanctioned by the U.S. after spending the last twenty years kind of projecting himself as being a reformed criminal, sort of wide, you know, wide boy. Um, he is named as an enforcer and as a key money laundering figure for the Kinahan cartel. And that money laundering is being conducted through Nero Vodka, which although it says he does, he isn't the registered owner, he is the, I can't remember the exact term, but it's some basically the de facto controller of that company. So to read from the U.S. Treasury to to recall yeah. what they said about him um, during the announcement, they say Irish national, yeah, J. John Francis Morrissey, John Morrissey, currently based in Spain, was designated for materially assisting, sponsoring, or providing financial material or technological support for our goods or services to or in support of the Kinahan Organised Crime Group. John Morrissey has worked for the KOCG for several years, including as an enforcer and facilities international facilitate, sorry, international drug shipments for the organization from South America. Yeah. John Morrissey is also involved in money laundering. Yeah. About the Nero Drinks Company Limited. They said it's a UK based alcoholic beverage company. Nero Drinks was designated for being owned or controlled by, directly or indirectly, John Morrissey. John Morrissey, who outwardly serves as the Nero Drinks brand ambassador, is heavily invested in Nero Drinks and has given a significant portion of the business to Daniel Kinahan yeah. to compensate for loads of drugs seized by law enforcement. Yeah. John Morrissey controls and operates Nero Drinks through his wife the primary shareholder who's used as a front person for his interests. Yeah. So he he owed uh, Daniel Kinahan something like 80% of, uh, you know, the profits, I think, at yeah. Nero or whatever. I mean, there's laundering going on. You can't really, yeah. really see profits, yeah. what they are in it. But something like 80% of it, I think, was owned by Kinahan. Yeah, it? yeah. So he was essentially, he was organizing drug shipments from South America for the Kinahan organization, the US Treasury, tell us. Yeah. And any of them that went missing, yeah. he was owing money for. Yeah, look, I mean, we don't... Exactly. Well, that's what they say. Yeah, that's what they say. So, yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, what has been described as the Kinahans were facilitators, I think, for for the purchase of the drugs in, yeah. South, in South America. And then 
they would either try and bring them in themselves or else they'd be given to people to get from South America to Europe at their own cost, effectively. So, you know, what Johnny Morrissey, I mean, the Americans have laid it out clearly. But either way, he was up to his neck with the Kinnan cartel. Sure was. And Nero Vodka was a vehicle for disguising that that drug wealth. I mean, that that is what is stated really, really clearly. You know, yeah, so the next thing that happens then is is up to what you're talking about, yeah. the arrest of John Morrissey. So John Morrissey then, a number of months later, what is it, five or six months later, September, the Spanish police put out images of uh, what they describe as uh, one of the leading figures in the biggest money laundering operation that's ever occurred on Spanish soil or something along those lines. And you can see what they do is they, I think they had a picture of him being arrested mm-hmm. and his face is pixelated, but you can see... Uh, this is his pre slim down days. You can see a bald head and you can see a chunky individual of a certain uh, age. And straight away, you know, this this is Johnny Morrissey. Mm. Um, he then did their subsequently pictures emerge in the media of the house being out, being raided by police. And there is a very famous picture of Nicola Morrissey, uh, as you said, previously last seen wearing a sort of gown ball standing beside a, a Rolls Royce. Ball gown, not a gown ball. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what is it again? A ball gown. Ball gown, saying. ball gown. Yeah, well, I've never... What wore, happened there? Just I don't know. It's just, it just yeah. Um, but you see her, in her uh, <laughs> instead in uh, being... I think she's wearing flip-flops. Is she given the... Given the middle finger it to the camera, looks fairly glam. And fairly it looks fairly glam. If you're gonna put in there, yeah. But she's given the the, the yeah. middle finger to the camera. She was arrested, but not arrested charged. In the house. And like that time, that was so that was September 2022, yeah. and it was detectives from six different police forces involved yeah. in that, and that included the Garda Chicana, the Spanish Guarda Civil, the USDA Law Enforcement Agency. They took part in that in yeah. that raid on in the Costa del Sol, and Morrissey appeared in court um, after spending two nights in custody. And he was uh, essentially put directly into prison yeah, then yeah. as the magistrate then takes over this yeah. money laundering investigation. But we did hear evidence of the level of money he yeah. was laundering through yeah. the Nero Vodka company. So, I mean, it's an, an incredible figure. I mean, I think in the 18, they said in the 18 months before his arrest was the figure 200 million euros was suspected of being laundered, which sort of breaks down to something like 350,000 euros a day. And we subsequently heard more information about that investigation through other sources effectively saying that they're using this system, Hawala, which is, you know, it's in place in the Middle East. Some of it is being, it's suspected is being facilitated in the Lebanon by Hezbollah. And it's effectively a way for, you know, if you, you can, you can move money without any trace of, of, uh, you know, without any banking system effectively. Uh, It's very complicated, but. And a trust system. A trust system, basically, where somebody can, you can ring up and say. Waladars are essentially the bankers. They hold money in different countries. And if you owe. It yeah. works. It's you basically you, you get somebody collects money and he rings up his guy in, yeah. in, the, in the Middle East and says, I've got three million here and that's taken on trust. So look, it's a very elaborate system. But so you've heard more and more about that and, and that, you know, there, there's a belief that's why the US uh, government have paid such attention to European drug dealers, which is really a continent away and they haven't always. But some of their interest stems from the fact that that some of this money is washing back to to enemies of the US state like Hezbollah yeah. and in the Middle East where obviously the US have had, you know, a huge interest to say the least. So Johnny Morrissey is lands in jail. Yeah. Um, and Nicola Morrissey kind of goes to ground. I mean, she, she disappears a little bit off the radar. Um, she doesn't get held or brought before the courts no. or whatever, but she's released. Certainly, I think she goes back into the uh, into some friends she has in the Costa. I don't think she's left the Costa, but she's been she's been around there. She hasn't been around the ho- the house, this mansion we described that was kind of dedicated to the Emperor Nero has pretty much gone to rack and ruin. It's certainly been left. We have had people have a look at that. And it looks as if, you know, the key was literally turned in the door and nothing has happened since. Now, on May 27th, Johnny Morrissey walked free from Al Horin de la Torre prison after finally getting bail. He is 64 years of age at this stage 
and he is said to have paid a significant amount of bail yeah. money I think, for his trial. Yeah, I think I think as far as we know that he because those those hearings aren't as public, sometimes they aren't even public at all. Like like You know what I found out recently, yeah. right? Do you know how we sort of will try and find out dates in the yeah. courts and all the rest of it? They won't even give the date no. to publicly until it gets to a certain point yeah. in trial. Yeah. So it's a very complex system. It's a very sort of maybe I'm going to say anti media. Well it's just a system. yeah, it's a totally different system. I mean in Not Ireland protective for the criminals. It is, but in Ireland we have it very much written into our constitution that justice must be seen to be done in public. But that hasn't that's not the same in in Europe. There's it's a different, a different non common law system, I suppose. So you know, but we have heard that Johnny Morrissey has attempted to get bail before. Um, obviously, the longer the, it goes without the case coming to court, the more chance somebody is has of getting bail, and he's put down a significant amount of money. And I, we would imagine that there's very stringent conditions regarding travel and passports and signing on and, and all for of sure. that. Sure, and like the laws do exist in Spain that you can't be held in custody for longer than two years before trial. September would be the two year yeah. put off for that. So we're now into June. Yeah. Um. So he applied and he got it. Yeah. I mean, he was going to get it in September anyway, yeah. this bail. And, you know, it's understood that, that his trial will hopefully get up and running by next year in Spain. Um, obviously, that's if he doesn't leave Spain. Yeah, I mean... He's not supposed to, but maybe no. before him have. I mean, you've seen Nicola Morrissey and we've done the odd story in, in the meantime about... You know, we're redesignating comp- the company names. You know, moving the registered address. So, you know, they. I suppose the 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 police will be keeping an eye to see what money is where. Johnny Morrissey obviously is operating with guys in the Middle East on an honor system, mm. and you have to wonder, you know, how how efficient the police are going to be in getting that money. It's certainly going to be a difficult job. I mean, remember these kind of money laundering fraud cases in Ireland as well are hugely complicated. Mm, okay. um, so they're not, you know, like somebody is, you know, the fingerprints on the gun type of mm-hmm. things, especially with international finance. Um, but Johnny Morrissey, yeah, he, he's... So he, let's go back full circle to where we started yeah. with that picture that he has released on, on social media. Um, that confident grin, the cigar hanging out of his yeah. mouth, pouring a glass of Nero vodka for a youngster uh, who we have pixelated yeah. in, in the photograph, although he didn't yeah. on his social media. Um, what is that picture telling us? I mean, that, through all that, is he... That picture tells, tells it's not telling us, I'd say. I'd say he's telling people in the criminal fraternity I'm I'm back. I'm fitter than ever. Yeah. I'm unbowed, unbeaten, and, and I'm not touting. I'm not touting, and yeah. I'm no, and I'm no. Uh, I'm back in back in business, and yeah. you know. But Johnny Morrissey is like in a tricky position in many ways. Okay, he's still before the Spanish courts. He's likely to be up on massive money laundering charges next year in Spain if he remains for trial. Um. He is somebody who cannot let his guard down with the Kinahan yeah. operation because undoubtedly he has a lot to tell should he go down that road. Yeah, I mean, and he could... Uh, he... His, his life, given their track record um, of being bloody untrustworthy yeah. with people, uh, they have well, many a time, shown that they can take out their own... Um, He's in a he's in a position that maybe he has the years, the decades, the experience to deal with, to handle. Yeah, at sixty four, going on sixty five years of age, but uh, not a place I'd like to be. I have no, to no. Though we can apply if he's an Irish national, which I did forget about actually. Yeah. So he must have got a passport in some of that time. So he's one of ours. God, he can come back and get his bus pass next year, can he? At sixty five, yeah, pension. Is he yeah, yeah. That? yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But I mean, it's it'll be cold After comfort. What we discovered about the other fella the other day that if you're there's a threat to your, threat to your life, you can get disability. Yeah, yeah. You could come home here and apply for disability benefits. You probably <laughs> possibly could, but it may not be as attractive as it may not be enough for a man of his uh, lifestyle to no, live off two hundred and five no. euro a week. There's only so many Cuban cigars you can buy. All right, with that. Yeah. Anyway, so that's um, John Marcy. That's Johnny Marcy. Until the next chapter. Yeah. Opens exactly. We'll leave it at that. Exactly. 
I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.